This is the motto of the show, Hour of the Truth. Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send on their crusades. Times and methods may have changed, the goal still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible believing people who have hold the truth in Jesus Christ's name. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believe in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ is vain He suffered by His death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand the Roman popes rule the land those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy we won't be loved by Rome sweet lie with fifty million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. A sovereign God give faith to man. Salvation's in the Maker's hand. This gospel offends Rome today. They offer up another way, a counterfeit. A compromise, beware the ancient papal lie With such a cloud of witnesses Who by grace died in their Lord Recall their memory to say By the same faith we live today I see the great apostasy I see the desolation of Christendom. I see the smoke and ruins. I see the reign of monsters. I see those vice gods that Gregory the Seventh, that Innocent the Third, that Boniface the Eighth, that Alexander the Sixth, that Gregory the Thirteenth, that Pius the Ninth. I see their long succession. I hear their insufferable blasphemies. I see their abominable lives, I see them worshipped by blinded generations, bestowing hollow benedictions, bartering, lying indulgences, creating a paganized Christianity. I see their liveried slaves, their shaven priests, their celibate confessors. I see the infamous confessional, the ruined woman, the murdered innocents. I hear the lying absolutions, the dying groans. I hear the cries of the victims. I hear the anathemas, the curses, the thunders of the interdicts. I see the racks. I see the dungeons. I see the stakes. I see that inhumane inquisition, those fires of Smithfield, those butcheries of St. Bartholomew, that Spanish armada, those unspeakable dragonades, that endless train of wars, that dreadful multitude of massacre. I see it all, and in the name of the ruin it has brought in the church and in the world, in the name of the truth it has denied, the temple it has defiled, the God it has blasphemed, the souls it has destroyed, in the name of the millions it has diluted, the millions it has slaughtered, the millions it has damned. With holy confessors, with noble reformers, with innumerable martyrs, with the saints of ages, 
I denounce it as the masterpiece of Satan, as the body and soul and essence of Antichrist. The masterpiece of Satan that you've just heard is taken from Henry Gretton Guinness's book of 1888, Romanism and the Reformation. It is cited in also a few other works. Among one is All Roads Lead to Rome, that was written by Michael de Semlian and I read on my channel some time ago. And the other one is Antichrist Exposed, the Reformed and Puritan View of the Antichrist, Volume 1, by the author Ronald N. Cook. And there it is stated on the back side of the book, on the back page of the book. Okay? So that everybody who takes this book into hand and looks at the, at the front and then looks at the back knows from the beginning what this book is all about. This is a wonderful, wonderful book. It is a book that explains so many things that are even today for many people who are aware of futurism, even they don't understand correctly. Even I found some confirmation of things that, for example, Tom Fress and Inquisition Update said, and we are glad to have found two references in this book that take away the quote-unquote honor of the Jesuits to run with the honors of quote-unquote inventing futurism. Because futurism, that is the sickness of today's world, has been taught in the Roman Catholic Church for all times. And this work from Ronald N. Cook makes that very clear on, for example, two pages. And after I've read these two excerpts, I've read the whole book, which consists of 333 pages or 334 pages, 335. I'm going to read to you a few excerpts from that book. And that you understand what these excerpts are, we go first through the contents of the book from Donald N. Cook. Um, the book is split into four parts. Part one deals with the rise to power of the historical man of sin, the Antichrist in the early church, the growth of the papacy, Gregory the Great and the expansion of papal power, the pornocracy of Antichrist, the deceptions of the Antichrist, and the end of the first millennium. Then we go into part two, the identification of the Antichrist in pre-Reformation times in the Roman Catholic system, dealing with cryptic accusations made against the papacy by Malachi or Morga, Hildegard von Bingen and Gerho of Reichersberg. Then we speak about Joachim of Fiore, charges and countercharges of Antichrist. The Pope is the Antichrist, <laughs> very important part, that's why it takes ten pages. The dissenters of the Middle Ages and their struggle with the Roman Antichrist. The greater protests against the papacy and Rome in the Dark Ages. We speak about the Paulicians. We speak about the Vaudois, the Cathari or Albigenses. And then also the lesser protests against the papal Antichrist in the Dark Ages. Minor groups of the Middle Ages, like, have you ever heard of the Pretrobrusians, Almeritians, Bedouins, Apostles of Christ, contemporary Manichaeans and Lombards? We speak about the morning star of the Reformation, John Wycliffe. The testimony of the Lollards against Antichrist, Jan Hus and the Hussites, the Inquisition and the Roman Catholic apostasy, the inquisitorial activities of the historical man of sin and the auto da fe. In part three, that deals with the reformers' view of Antichrist, because we have already now entered the time of the Reformation. Okay? So, the dawning of the Reformation era. Martin Luther, Luther and his battle with Antichrist. And then we speak of the reformers John Calvin, Ulrich Zwingli, Philip Melanchthon, Martin Bucer, Heinrich Bullinger. And in part four, the Reformation in England, we speak about William Tyndale, Nicholas Ridley, John Bradford, the other English reformers testified against the historical men of sin, names you've never heard before. We speak about John Bale, John Fox, the author of Fox's Book of Martyrs. We speak about the Huguenots and the men of sin. 
Francis Turretin's identification of the man of sin, the historic Baptist view of Antichrist, and finally John Bunyan. And this is the end of volume one of a two-volume book. So I'm not going to read the whole book, at least not for now, because the next book that I'm going to read is a book that I will receive within the fortnight, and that is from Avro Manhattan, Vietnam, Why Did We Go? The physical book I will receive as a gift from a German sister. Thank you very much, Miss Marple, for sending me those books, among others, Vietnam, Why Did We Go? And that's the next book that is on my schedule to read in English. But this Antichrist Exposed I read for myself, and I want to share that with you. I want to give you the ISBN number so that you can order this book. It's only for a few dollars available. You can get it, and it is absolutely worth reading. But what I said in my introduction was that the Roman Catholic Church always, from the beginning actually, taught a future Antichrist. One single quote unquote a bad man that comes on the um, planks of this world and claims to be Antichrist. Yeah? That is their teaching all along. Because the Roman Catholic Church has to invent a counter teaching of Antichrist where the Antichrist is someone else but itself and therefore she invented a quote-unquote seven-year tribulation in the future. She invented a quote-unquote rapture of the church. And you have this whole Left Behind series, and I'm dealing with that extensively. When I read with Brother Tom Fress from Inquisition Update, the book End Time Delusions by Steve Wahlberg. So I'm not going too deep into that right here now, because you can watch that book reading then. But Tom always said, the Roman Catholic Church taught futurism from the very beginning. He always made the point that when clerics within the Roman Catholic Church, even in the beginning years of the Roman Catholic Church, where it maybe even wasn't the Re Roman Catholic Church, but it was the Church that became apost apostate, that in that Church the official teaching was Antichrist is someone who comes in the future. And especially with the Reformation, the spotlight had to be taken away from the Roman Catholic Church being the Antichrist. And therefore the Jesuits taught futurism out in the open. Most famous for that is Jesuit Francisco Ribera, who in 1590-1591 published his thesis, his commentary on the Apocalypse, in a futuristic way. And that is the foundation of the whole futurist teaching that is all over the world today. But by this futurist teaching, the whole world is deceived. The whole world was deceived all through the ages. And Ronald N. Cook gives two, um, um, two explanations in his book. And not only explanations, but also mentions sources where futurism has been taught from the beginning of that church. Now, the first time we come across that in this book is on page 13. It is about uh, the subject, uh, the, the, the chapter, Antichrist in the Early Church, speaking of in, this, in a subchapter of three quote-unquote church fathers, namely Irenaeus, Hippolytus and Tertullian. Now, Irenaeus lived between 130 AD and about 202 AD, so from the 2nd century until the very beginning of the 3rd century was his lifetime. And Ronald N. Cook has the following to say. Irenaeus taught that Antichrist would come in the flesh, and he thought that he would be a Jew and arise from the tribe of Dan, a view which is still current today. Uh, remind you, this book from Ronald N. Cook is from 2006. So, very current. A view which is still current today among some writers. Yeah, all the writers of the Jesuitical futurist agenda, of course. He sought to give the meaning of the number 603 score and 6, although he was far from dogmatic in doing so. 
he believed the Antichrist would rule for three and a half years, speaking of literal years, and reject the idea that Antichrist was only to be found in apostates from the faith. He saw Antichrist as a single evil person who would possess a kingdom. In Against Heresies, which is the most known work that uh, Irenaeus is known for, he writes of the fraud, pride and tyrannical kingdom of Antichrist as described by Daniel and Paul. He taught that Antichrist was an apostate and a robber who was anxious to be adored as God and one who wishes to be proclaimed as a king. So here you already see that Irenaeus, who lived in the beginning of the second until the very beginning of the third century, was already a teacher of a futurist antichrist. Now Irenaeus, um, it says, had heard the preaching of Polycarp. And Polycarp is the last known living connection with the apostles, who in turn was said to have heard John the Evangelist. Now, so we know Polycarp was a quote-unquote pupil of the Apostle John and Irenaeus heard the teachings of Polycarp, probably even met him. So there's a real connection to the very first church or the very first churches. Now, Paul said in his letter to the Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that the mystery of iniquity doth already work, and that was in the 50s of the very first century. So of course that mystery of iniquity kept on, kept on working. And Irenaeus is one who is also a part of that. With his view of the Antichrist, he did not understand the papacy, which of course wasn't in working at the time, because the Caesars, the Roman Caesars, still were in power. But he did not see that what Paul taught in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7 and 8, that he who now letteth the emperor of Rome must be taken out of the way, and then that man of sin will be revealed. That is something that Irenaeus didn't understand. Many other real true Christians understood that, but Irenaeus is a quote-unquote church father. Call nobody father but the one who is in heaven, right? Nobody here on earth. Huh? So Irenaeus is part of the fallen away church, especially with his view of Antichrist. Now that was only on page 13, but there is another part that is very important and that we come across on page 227. And that is in the chapter that deals with uh, Calvin, John Calvin. That is from page 221 to page 230. And on page 227 the author says, he, speaking of Calvin, maintained that a great deception would accompany Antichrist. Quote, we see that almost the whole world has been miserably deceived, as if not a word had ever been said about Antichrist. Unquote. He also observed that under the papacy, quote, the future coming of Antichrist unquote, is the common teaching, and those laboring under this deception have become so dull that they do not see that this tyranny is exercised over them now. Now, Calvin lived between 1508 and 1569. Jesuit Francisco Ribera publishing his commentary on the Apocalypse or Revelation in 1590, 1591 he died, means that Calvin, first of all, did not know Francisco Ribera, Second of all, did not know the writing of Francisco Barbera because that was still future, real future. <laughs> not the invented future of the Jesuits, okay? So here we know already that when Calvin speaks of, and I quote again, he also observed that under the papacy the future coming of Antichrist is the common teaching. When Calvin says that in the beginning of the 16th century, but on the last decade of the 16th century only the Jesuits quote-unquote invent futurism so that must have been a teaching all along being in that church as we stated already on page 13. So my point 
why I'm reading that, and this is the beginning of all the quotes I'm going to read from that book, my point of reading that is, please do not give the Jesuits credit for everything. And surely do not give them credit for things that have been taught all the church age long. When we understand that Irenaeus taught that already in the second century, then we can surely say today in 2020 that that teaching has been around for almost 1800 full years. At least, because Irenaeus is the one that we know from here. There's no security that the teaching hasn't been around by somebody else even earlier. There is, in my understanding, a very sure reason to understand when we read the Bible that the future teaching of Antichrist has been already in the very first century act been, been active. That that is something that even Paul spoke in 2 Thessalonians 2. I am quite sure about that. And we're going to read a part of the Bible right now to understand what I mean. In 2 Timotheus 2, Paul wrote in verse 16, But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hermeneus and Philetus, who, concerning the truth, have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. Maybe you say, well, this is not an idea of futurism, this is more preterism, because Hymenaeus and Philetus taught that Jesus Christ has already come, the resurrection is already past, speaking of the resurrection of the righteous, yeah? who concerning the truth have erred, saying the resurrection is past already. That is maybe more than... Uh, futurism, maybe more uh, preterism teaching, but anyway it is a false teaching. And even preterism has been picked up by the Roman Catholic Church by yeah, Louis de Alcazar. <laughs> Sometimes I forget the easiest names which are always on my mind otherwise when I do readings like this, but you know that happens. Anyway even if we understand this writing from Paul in 2 Timothy 2 to be a teaching of preterism, Preterism is a quote-unquote Jesuit invention as people think futurism is a Jesuit invention and this not. It has been there from the beginning. So whether um, it is preterism or it is futurism, it is both a false teaching because the true teaching is historicism. That's what this whole book is all about. Antichrist exposed the reformed and Puritan view of the Antichrist. Now, since I don't read the whole book, but made already a very valid point in the beginning, I'm just going through the book and I um, underlined here and there a sentence or put an exclamation mark or another sign um, on the side of a paragraph that I'm going to read to you. Now, from the same chapter where we, uh, where we just read from, Irenaeus, Hippolytus and Tertullian, these quote-unquote church fathers, uh, on page 16 we read, like Irenaeus, Hippolytus taught that Antichrist would reign upon the earth for three and a half years and to go to war and to go war against the Jews. The Jesuits would later take this idea of Antichrist and the Jews and use it to deflect attention away from the papacy and concentrate it on the future battle between Antichrist and the Jews, thus removing the issue of the Church completely from the tyranny of Antichrist. So all this teaching has but one goal, to claim to the world the papacy is not the Antichrist, someone else is the Antichrist, and therefore the Reformation was wrong and everything that happened in the Reformation. But I'm not going to jump to conclusions. I'm just going to read to you excerpts of the book, which I find very, very interesting to read to you. And this is probably even going to take more than one video to go through. But that's no problem. And I surely hope that you will spend a few dollars and uh, get this book and read it for yourself. Because if I have time in the future to read it, I do not know yet. Again, on page 17, still under the same subchapter, we read, quote, this is from um, Eusebius, And ye know what detaineth, 
that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery doth already work. Only he who now hinders must hinder until he be taken out of the way. What obstacle is there but the Roman state, the falling away of which by being scattered into ten kingdoms shall introduce Antichrist upon its ruins? Unquote. And this is taken from Roberts and Donaldson on citation on volume 3, page 563. So, Ronald Cook works, of course, with many, many sources, and he brings many, many interesting points. We read now from Cyril of Jerusalem on page 18, still on the same chapter, uh, still from the same chapter and on the same subject. Most men have departed from right words, they rather choose the evil, men love darkness rather than light. Quote from Cyril of Jerusalem in his lecture on Antichrist. This, therefore, is the falling away, and the enemy is soon to be looked for. Look, therefore, to thyself, O man, and make safe thy soul. The church now charges thee before the living God. She declares to thee the things concerning Antichrist before they arrive. Whether they will happen in thy time, we know not. Or whether they will happen after thee, we know not. But it is well that knowing these things, thou shouldst make thyself secure beforehand. And then he later adds to this saying, quote, Since the true Christ is to come a second time, the adversary, taking occasion by the expectation of the simple, brings in a certain man, most expert in sorceries and enchantments of beguiling craftiness who shall seize for himself the power of the Roman Empire and shall falsely style himself Christ. But this aforesaid Antichrist is to come when the times of the Roman Empire shall have been fulfilled. The Antichrist, who by his magical craft shall seize upon the Roman power, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall surpass all kingdoms. And that this kingdom is that of the Romans has been the tradition of the church's interpreters. Unquote. So Cyril of Jerusalem really understands the real teaching of the Antichrist, the historicist teaching. Now we speak of Jerome on the next page, on page 19. Jerome, in his explanation of the page in the, of the passage, sorry, uh, Jerome, in his explanation of the passage in 2 Thessalonians, referring to the restrainer, uh, this is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7 and 8, quote, Unless the Roman Empire be first desolated and Antichrist precede, Christ shall not come. Quote, and now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. Unquote. That is, ye know very well. What is the reason why Antichrist does not come at present? He, speaking of Paul, is not willing to say openly and boldly that Antichrist shall not come unless the Roman Empire be first destroyed. It might probably have proved the occasion of persecution against the church. Unquote. This is from Jerome. So Jerome explains to us while Paul's, why Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Do you not remember what I told you while I was still with you? When Paul was face to face with the Thessalonians, he told them, he who now let us who that was, that that was the Roman Empire. But Paul couldn't afford to put that in writing, because if his letter would have been caught by the Romans, he would have been put, uh, caught for sedition, you know? overthrowing or knowing the the overthrow of the emperor. Uh, that's very clear. That's why the Bible makes this point but doesn't speak the actual words that the Caesar has to be taken out of the way. But that's exactly what Paul meant. And that's what Paul said to the Thessalonians when he was still with them. Now, the author continues to say, Chrysostom remarks that Paul expresses himself here rather obscurely when he says 
that what withhold it will withhold until he be taken out of the way. He then gives the reasons why he believes he does this. And this is so wonderful, you don't even need my explanation, just read in the book. Quote, Some say the grace of the Spirit withholds, but others the Roman Empire, whom I most of all exceed. Wherefore? Because if he meant to say the Spirit, he would not have spoken obscurely, but plainly, that even now the grace of the Spirit, that is the gifts, withhold him. And otherwise he ought now to have come, if he was about to come, when the gifts ceased, for they have long since ceased. But because he said this of the Roman Empire, he naturally glanced at it, and speaks covertly and darkly. For he did not wish to bring upon himself superfluous enmities and useless dangers. For if he had said that after a little while the Roman Empire should be dissolved, they would immediately have overwhelmed him as a pestilent person and all the faithful as living and warring to this end. And he did not say quickly, although he is always saying it in another context. But what? That he may be revealed in his own season. We go to the next page and we read in the, on the next page, again from Chrysostom. Chrysostom personifies several abstract terms in Second Thessalonians 2. He remarks that Antichrist is revealed after the great falling away and that Paul calls, quote, him apostasy as being about to destroy many and make them fall away, so that if it were possible, he says, the very elect would be offended. And he calls him, quote, unquote, the man of sin, for he shall do numberless mischiefs and shall cause others to do them. But he calls him, quote, the son of perdition, unquote, because he is also to be destroyed. But who is he? Is it then Satan? By no means, but some man that admits his fully working in him. For he is a man that exalted himself against all that is called God or is worshipped. For he will introduce idolatry, but will be a kind of opponent to God. He will abolish all the gods, and will order men to worship him instead of God. And he will be seated in the temple of God, not that in Jerusalem only, but also in every church. Hmm. Setting himself forth, he says, he does not say, he does not say saying it, but endeavoring to show it, for he will perform great works and will show wonderful signs. Chrysostom also notes in this regard, quote, Only there is one that restraineth now, until he be taken out of the way, that is, when the Roman Empire is taken out of the way, then he shall come. And naturally, for as long as the fear of this empire lasts, no one will willingly exalt himself. But when that is dissolved, he will attack the anarchy and endeavor to seize upon the government both of man and God. End quote from Chrysostom. So, you see, when we started with Irenaeus, a quote-unquote church father who taught about the um, future Antichrist, we are now speaking of Jerome and speaking of Chrysostom, and they have the real biblical, the apostolic view on things. Now, the author continues on the next page, the issue of who or what restraints until he be taken out of the way has been addressed in several different ways over the years. The most popular view today among evangelicals in this country, speaking of the United States of America, is that it is the Holy Spirit who restrains Antichrist, because that's what futurists teach. Now, when the church is raptured, <laughs> which is not going to happen, then the restrainer is said to leave with the church and then the Antichrist is revealed. 
John Nelson Darby and the Schofield Reference Bible would maintain this view or something very close to it. Now this is the important sentence. This is why, um, why I took note of this part. John Nelson Darby and the Schofield Reference Bible would maintain this view of something very close to it. Now you have to understand the Schofield Bible is not a Bible Schofield wrote for himself. Schofield uses the King James. But with footnotes he edits the King James in a way that you even read the King James Bible as a futurist Bible. And what's concerning the King James you also have to be careful not to take the 1769 Blaney version but the real AV 1611 authorized version from for example Hendrickson in the Old English to read that and to understand that because there have been made some changes. Anyway the author continues about some other teachers of um, these very first times and he speaks here of an, a certain Alford and this Alford made an interesting comment when he wrote quote, the interpretations of the ancient fathers deserve all respect short of absolute adoption because they were their interpretations in living near the time when the speaking voice still lingered in the church they had an advantage over us. In living far down in the unfolding of God's purposes, we have an advantage over them. The possibly heard things, uh, sorry, they possibly heard things which we have never heard. We certainly have seen things they have never seen. And then we go into another part of the book chapter 2 that is called the growth of the papacy I don't know if I made note no I didn't make annotations here the next chapter then is called Gregory the Great and the expansion of papal power and this is very important because you know between every chapter the author takes the time to um, write a little page that is called pause to consider to make uh, and uh, how do you say that um, to make a blending over from the one to the next chapter so from the chapter that I just skipped over I mean I didn't um, I didn't take any notes of this um, of the chapter that is called uh, the growth of the papacy it is very interesting but I just didn't think there was anything so important to put in this video um, we are going to read pause to consider before we go into Gregory the Great and the expansion of papal power. And on page 32 the author writes here, Every act which emanates from the civil power must be in exact conformity with the laws of the Church. Any infringement of these laws is a violation of the essential principle on which all authority rests, conformity with the divine will. <laughs> divine will of course is the papal will in this regard yeah? but the point that he makes is very important and I want to mention another video I'm just going to read the sentence again the first part of it every act which emanates from the civil power so that is your government federal, state, local, municipal every act which emanates from the civil power must be in exact conformity with the laws of the church that means all the laws of the civil power must be in exact conformity with Roman Catholic canon law. Now therefore watch a video that is called Vatican Control Through Civil Law by Richard Bennett, our deceased brother, I think he died in 2000 and 19 last year in the end of the year I think in November or somewhere God bless his soul and we will see him back in the resurrection he made this video Vatican control through civil law and I have that on my YouTube channel I will put the link to the, in the description box of this video so that you can have a look at it. it is absolutely important to understand that because also here Ronald N. Cook in this post to consider on page 32 speaks about this Every act which emanates from the civil power must be an act, uh, must be an exact conformity with the laws of the church. So 
all civil laws in your country, and not only in the United States, but in all countries that have concorded with the Roman Catholic Church, if there's more than 179 countries for the moment, um, you can check that out on Concordat Watch, all the laws there, the civil laws, must be in exact concordance or conformity with the laws of the Church. And the laws of the Church is the Justinian law, the Codex Justianus, and um, that is what is called the Roman Catholic Canon Law. And if the laws are not in exact conformity with the laws of the Church, these laws will not be pursued. And even the Church will make actions, will take actions to get rid of those laws. The civil power is not allowed to make their own laws. All their laws have to be in concordance with their Roman Catholic canon law. And by that we are all made Catholics, whether we are religiously Catholics or not. But in this world that we are living in, we are forced to be Catholics through the civil law, and the civil law adheres to the Roman Catholic canon law. That's the point. And that's the point Richard Bennett makes very well in his video, Vatican Control Through Civil Law, so that I advise you really to take a look at. So the author continues to say here, But what is conformable to the divine will the Church alone can declare? <laughs> and to all such declarations the civil power must render unhesitating obedience. The state is not competent to determine by its own authority its proper range and sphere. These are shaped out of it by the action of the Church. I cannot for an instant believe that this power, speaking of the power of the popes, so tremendous in its character was conferred on the papacy by the Christian kings and people, or that it was the mere result of the peculiar condition and circumstances of Europe. The popes themselves did not speak of their power to depose princes as a right derived from the will of kings and princes. They had a far higher idea of the source of this authority. They were not mere umpires before whom the nations had agreed to come for judgment, but judges on a tribunal set up by no earthly arm. They were not the vice regents of Christendom, but of Christ. They have the power and authority to annul the election or succession of an heretical prince and also to depose from the throne the prince who falls into heresy. This is taken from a Roman Catholic writer, E. S. Purcell, in a book of essays edited by Cardinal Manning. And now we go into Gregory the Great and the expansion of the papal power. And Gregory the Great, you have to understand, reigned as a pope from 1590 until 604, and he is the precursor of Antichrist, and he even warned in letters to the Emperor Maurice at that time that the Bishop of Rome, he will, who will call himself Bishop of Bishops, will be the precursor of Antichrist. Now, when Gregory the Great, who was no Pope, but he was just a Bishop of Rome, gave the power to his successor, Boniface III, Boniface III got the power from the then reigning Emperor in Constantinople, Phocas, who took away the spiritual power from the uh, Bishop of the Eastern Church, the Constantinople Church, and gave that spiritual power to the Western Bishop the Bishop of Rome. So the Bishop of Rome, Boniface III, that Bishop of Rome, Boniface III, under Emperor Phocas, was the first who got the spiritual power over the Eastern and the Western Church. And therefore, he was the first who called himself Universal Bishop. And therefore, he was the first Pope. I hope you understand, Peter, of course, was never in Rome. Peter was never a Pope. That's not the point, but the Roman Catholic Church claims to have apostolic succession, with Peter being the first pope, but the first pope actually was Boniface III. Yeah? He got the power over the Western and Eastern Church by the then Emperor Phocas. And from that time on, the papacy developed into the power that it did not accept to have been given the power by the Emperor, as it happened, really. But they say, we have divine power. 
they make themselves God. Yeah, Second Thessalonians 2, the papacy, all over again. So, we skip a few pages on page 40, we read, Dismissing as ridiculous and absurd the identifying of Antichrist as Simon Magus or Caligula, he then concludes his remarks on the rise of the Antichrist. He, we are speaking of um, the historian Pictet, and he so says, um, Antichrist may be regarded in his successive stages as conceived from the very times of the Apostles, Satan even preparing the way, also in the persecutions of Nero and during the prevalence of several heresies, as being born and revealed under Boniface III, as growing up to the maturity from that period to the reign of Benedict IX and Gregory VIII, and from thence as flourishing in vigor to the period of the Reformation. In the midst of the spiritual darkness of these centuries, starting from the 7th century, 606, 607 on, in the midst of the spiritual darkness of these centuries, scriptural exegesis was virtually unknown. The Latin Church had petrified. She looked to Ambrose for their sacerdotal pretensions, to Jerome for their authority for monasticism, and to Augustine for her author authoritarian dogmatics. The study of the Bible was forgotten and would never really be taken up again by the Roman Catholic Church. Very important parts. Now let me just uh, clarify that um, I have the book opened here and um, as I marked several page passages of this book I'm just going through it now from one quote to another and try to give it all to you. So on page 60 for example there is um, the word rapture that I underlined because the author uses this here and says we recount this excerpt from Miller which I haven't read now because it parallels the year 1999 in so many ways all kinds of tracts and books along with spoken messages on television and in the pulpit made the year 2000 very significant a prophecy and some even hinted or predicted the rapture would take place on or around that date. You still remember the why too gay uh, madness, I guess. But the year 2000, the author says, has now passed as of this writing, and the anti-Christian system of Rome is recovering from its wounds which ever, which, uh, with each passing year. While men look into futuristic crystal balls and try to forecast what's going on to us, transpire in some future time zone, the power of the present Antichrist continues to thrive and grow under their very noses, and they do not seem to be able to see it with all their expert visionary capabilities. Interesting point the author makes here, right? In other words, you don't see the elephant in the room. Okay? Now... Part 2 of the book, The Identification of the Antichrist in Pre-Reformation Times in the Roman Catholic System. We are now going through several sub-chapters here, and we are going to begin with uh, page 63 in the very beginning, on the very first paragraph. It speaks here about the cryptic accusations made against the papacy by Malachi O'Morger, Hildegard von Bingen, who was a nun in Germany, and Gerho of Reichersberg. The accusation of Antichrist hurled against the papacy. In times of spiritual barrenness and deadness, there is very little interest in the issue and identity of Antichrist. This is the sentence the subject, uh, this chapter starts with, and that is the sentence that I wanted to read to you and uh, explain to you. In times of spiritual barrenness and deadness, there is very little interest in the issue of the identity of Antichrist. That is why, over such a very long time, in the quote-unquote Dark Ages, in the time when the people didn't have the Bible, and certainly not in their own language, there was no interest in identifying the Antichrist, and there was no possibility in identifying the Antichrist. It was a time of spiritual barrenness and deadness. Okay? And that is exactly the time that we are in today. 
A few hundred years ago, or a thousand years ago, about the time that we are speaking here, that spiritual badness and deadness, in that time they took away the Bibles from the people. Today they don't take away the Bibles from the people, but they take away the time for the people to read their Bibles, to study their Bibles, and they educate everyone in this world to accept that the Bible is just a fancy fairy tale book and not the guide through life that God supposed it to be for us. Yeah? We are today living in spiritual barrenness and deadness as the people in the dark ages, even though we are quote unquote enlightened, even though we are quote unquote um, educated. Yeah? And I say quote unquote because, you know, enlightenment is of course something that comes from Gnosticism and I'm not uh, proposing Gnosticism. But we have every chance of informing ourselves, teaching ourselves today teaching ourselves in the things of this world, but also have a possibility to go over and teach ourselves in the things of the Spirit. And therefore is also the Bible very important. But who reads the Bible today? Who reads historical books today? Who reads history books today to, when he understands history, can make real predictions to the, uh, uh, of the future events that are coming, especially when you measure your um, understanding at the Bible in books like the book of uh, Revelation and something like that. Who does that? People are so busy with their smartphones, with their television, with their sports and music and entertainment all around. Satan uses every little device he can even think of to turn you away from Jesus Christ. And that's how he made the time that even we are living now in the 21st century a new time of spiritual barrenness and deadness. And it is time to wake up again. It is time to kick some behind, I'd like to say. And the behind we should most certainly kick is the behind of the Antichrist. Now, on page 67 we come across another little note where the author says, True biblical interpretation within the system of Rome at this time was almost impossible. Commentators on the scriptures were hampered by the hideous fourfold sense of scripture which dominated any attempt at exegesis in this era. Augustine had said years before that the spiritual and allegorical interpretation revealed the real meaning of the Bible while the literal interpretation kills. So with that for a precedent, a precedent, sorry, <laughs> not precedent, but precedent, the true meaning of scripture was lost. As Fullert noted, quote, when the historical sense of a passage is once abandoned, there is wanting any sound regulative principle to govern exegesis. We go into the next part of this chapter, and that is about the person that is called Joachim of Fiore. Who was Joachim of Fiore? Well, you gotta read through the book. I just made a few notations here, and um, that's why I'm reading on page 71, the next part of the second paragraph on the page. As Richard, I was on his way to the Holy Land. He stopped off in Messina and had an interview with Joachim. The king gave his view of Antichrist that was defended by the archbishops of Rouen and Auxerre, that's in France, and by the bishop of Bayonne, all of whom were present at this interview. King Richard, yeah, speaking of the king who was reigning in England in the 13th century, uh, Richard the Lion King is probably <laughs> not, not the Lion King from Disney, but you know, um, is, is the name that you know him from. King Richard said that he thought that Antichrist was to be born in Antioch or Babylon of the tribe of Dan and would reign in the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem after he had reigned for three and a half years. He would dispute with Elijah and Enoch and then would kill them and afterwards die himself. After this, God would give sixty days of repentance in which those who had erred from the truth might be able to repent after having been seduced by the teaching of the false prophets of Antioch. What I just read to you is, similarity, is uh, similar to the teaching of Futurism, and that was spoken of by King Richard, who reigned England in the 13th century. 
That's why I found that very interesting. Now, um, what is the next part we go into? Because there are so many things upcoming. We are going to the next chapter, chapter 9, Charges and Countercharges of Antichrist. And we read on page 78, When one looks at the various accusations hurled polemically back and forth between the adherents of the Papal Church and the heretics outside of it, he cannot help but notice that the heretics had far more scriptural phrases which applied to their version of Antichrist than their opponents. Okay. <clears throat> Reading it again. Uh, I'm just taking a paragraph here and there to um, <coughs> see if you get interested in reading the book. He says on page 78, third full paragraph on the page. When one looks at the various accusations hurled polemically back and forth between the adherents of the Papal Church and the heretics outside of it, he cannot help but notice that the heretics had far more scriptural phrases which applied to their version of Antichrist than their opponents. And why is that? Because the people within the Roman Catholic Church did not even have access to the Bible. They weren't trained to read the Bible. They weren't educated to read the Bible. They weren't given the Bible. And heretics were heretics because they got the Bible. Because that was forbidden. In those times, you were killed for having a Bible. You were burned at the stake. On page 87, another paragraph that I highlighted here that seems to be very interesting. We read in the last but one paragraph on the page, So, although for centuries a succession of theologians and ecclesiastics had held up the Roman Catholic Church as the Babylon of the Apocalypse, and others had taught that the, that the apocalyptic Babylon was in some sense or another not only pagan Rome, but papal Rome and that Antichrist was to sit, whether as a usurper or not, on the throne of the papacy. Such activity now ceased, and Roman Catholic scholars would now do everything to counteract and overthrow the reformed Protestant position on Antichrist. And with that, I have to go through a few pages more see where we come out where the next note is that I took in the beginning in the beginning I didn't take that many notes but uh, in the end of the book wow <laughs> almost the whole end of the book I'm gonna read to you but here we are going to read from page 98 that is part of the chapter called the greater protests against the papacy and Rome in the dark ages we are speaking here about the Paulicians yeah the quote-unquote sect of the Paulicians. I only underlined the last sentence of this paragraph, but I'm going to read to you the whole paragraph. Quote, he concludes this section of his work by noting that the term Manichaean had become a general and convenient term both in the Latin and the Greek churches, and was applied indiscriminately to any group which opposed the authority and uh, of the dominant church, which is the Roman Catholic Church. He then gives several examples from history to show how the term Manichaean was applied to anyone who opposed the church. Quote, Emperors who dared to oppose the worship of images were, banded as, were branded as Jews, Saracens and Manichaeans. Unquote. He says that, quote, and now comes the underlined sentence, so very important. He says that, quote, Pope Boniface VIII, condemned as Manichaeans all who recognized the authority of kings, unquote. For to do so meant that two principles of government were established, whereas the church recognizes only one authority, that is, the pope. Very, very important sentence. And I even like to stop here and uh, continue next time in another reading when we go into another chapter, but uh, just one explanation of this last sentence that I just read. Pope Boniface VIII, that is the Antichrist Boniface VIII who reigned in the time of 1203 when he put out his papal bull Unam Sanctam, 
Yeah? And in Unam Sanctum, the Pope stated, and therefore the Roman Catholic Church states, states, still states, as dogma up to today, that there is no salvation outside of the Roman Catholic Church. And Pope Boniface VIII said, it is absolutely necessary for the salvation of every human soul to become subject to the Roman Pontiff. That's the sense, that's the spirit of the bull Unam Sanctum, 1302, Pope Boniface VIII, and you can read that on the internet. You can get the bull, you can open it up for yourself. So Pope Boniface VIII condemned as Manichaeans all who recognize the authority of kings. So when you adhere to the king, adhere to the temporal ruler of the world, then you are a Manichaean, according to the Pope. For to do so meant that two principles of government were established, whereas the Church recognizes only one authority, and that's the Pope. Means, the Pope is the ruler of every man, he is the judge of every man, cannot be judged by man, there is no rule, there is no power, there is no law, but the rule and the power of the Roman Catholic Church. That's the point Pope Boniface VIII makes here, that's what he established, of course, in uh, the bull Unam Sanctum, because who doesn't want to get saved? Everybody wants to get saved, and that's why the Pope says salvation is not outside of the Roman Catholic Church. For salvation is, it's ab it is absolutely necessary for every human soul to become subject of the Roman Pontiff. Yeah? And here he says he condemns everyone as a Manichaean who recognizes the authority of kings. Because if you recognize the authority of kings, that means that there are two principles of government, but the Roman Catholic Church only accepts one form of government, and that's her form of government. And that's why you have in this last beast system, the Roman Catholic Church system, you have state and church combined. The church tells the state what to do, as it was in the Dark Ages, when the church condemned the heretics to death, and then gave them to the civil authorities, and they executed the uh, the um, uh, the judgment. The church spoke about them. The church, quote unquote, did not kill the people. <laughs> no, the church did not want to make her hands dirty or bath their hands in blood. They gave the authority or the they gave the order to the civil power to do that. The church didn't kill people. Well, until the 20th century when the Franciscans in the Balkans with the Croatians and the Ustashi killed uh, almost a million Serbs, of course. But that's something for another subject, for another reading, for another book. Uh, for this time I want to close with this, uh, uh, this quote that I read to you from page 98. I hope that you'll enjoy it because it's a different kind of reading because I don't read the whole book. I just got give an excerpt here and there. And of course, when you are able to buy that book and follow along in the reading, uh, you can also follow the uh, passages that I read here and maybe understand it even better. So I'm going to give you some time because after the publishing of this video, I will make a short pause until I read the next part. And in the meantime, you will all be able to get the book from Ronald N. Cook, Antichrist Exposed, The Reformed, The Puritan View of the Antichrist, Volume 1, because it's also Volume 2. I haven't read that yet. I still have to study that. And next time we go from page 98 on into many, 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 many other quotes and even partial readings of a few pages, because some things are so abhorrent to read, they need to be read in context and therefore I need a page or two or three sometimes to read. This was an introductory video, I hope you liked it, I hope you enjoyed it and I hope it puts you into thinking what you've heard and maybe what you even read when you got the book for yourself and I hope to see you next time and I hope that in the meantime I hope and pray that God will bless and protect you and that you will read the Bible. Until next time, Maranatha.